says that she loves me Isn't it lovely when the one who loves thing is the one who loving Labor Day. We know, those of you know, the Labor Day weekend, the Labor Day holiday, which is what, the first Monday, I guess, in September um, 18, I think Grover Cleveland was president, 1894, I think it became a holiday, um, a federal holiday. But here's the irony of the Labor Day holiday. This holiday started as labor fighting back because this is the days when white people were working 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Children were laboring in the mines, <laughs> you know, you have it, and they tried to push back because you start now we're talking about after the Civil War, we're really talking about the 1860s, 70s, 80s, uh, industrialization is beginning to take hold, the moving from an agricultural society eventually to an industrial society. So labor is serious. 1886 in Chicago, the famous Haymarket riot, where workers were killed, police were killed. Um, you see a uh, the in September, September the 5th, uh, 1882 in New York City. All you New Yorkers, all y'all people in Manhattan, you know where Union Square is. Union Square, 10,000 people show up in a in a strike, in a protest to demand labor and the staff, the, staff, the, the state passed labor laws. Well, they began to designate Labor Day as a day when workers come together. And here's the irony of Labor Day. A day started to recognize labor, and it's not the only one. A lot of people will talk about May Day. Maybe we'll talk about that next May. We'll get into the history of May Day. The international workers showing this. Uh, the irony is a, a holiday started for by labor has become a day that is celebrated by the owners. We celebrate labor. No, you don't. You took that holiday and turned it to the exact opposite. So all the rest of the year that y'all are working, for us, for lower wages than we should pay you, Cap, give it to us because we got a Labor Day sale. It's like, wait, 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 no, I work for you. No, see, so, let, so we know the holiday, but let, let's set aside the holiday and the social structure to deal with this question of governance structure. So, you know me, I'm looking up, go to the Oxford English Dictionary, talking about origins. Labor is a word that comes from the old French and the old, because, you know, like a lot of English words, they're really French words because the French occupied, well, the Gauls occupied in England. So a lot of those words we call English are really French, labor being one of them. Labor is from the old French. Um, and then that goes back to the Latin for not only work, but toil and also distress or trouble. Their breath was labored, distress. You know, it's the trouble, right? And so the Oxford English Dictionary, I like the Oxford English Dictionary because it has the etymologies, right? They talk about the exertion Labor means to exert the faculties of the body or mind, especially when compelled. So in other words, labor has become a word that is associated with doing something you don't want to do, but you got to do it. I got to go to the job. I got to go work. I got to go. It's modern uses like that. Physical exertion directed to the supply of material wants of the community. OK, that's a little closer. But I only started with the social structure definition because I wanted to go to the Africans. So, you know, I would usually start with the Egyptians. So the ancient Egyptian word for labor, I got a couple of the dictionaries, you know what I'm saying, but uh, here's a concise dictionary from Middle Egyptian. This, when you learn hieroglyphs, Dr. Beatty teaches hieroglyphs, he often uses this. This is the one he learned on that I learned on. And also Sir Alan Gardner, Egyptian grammar. This is the one I learned on. He doesn't use Egyptian grammar anymore, but Dr. Obenga taught us both on the Egyptian grammar. This is the one that we, uh, this is Martin Bernal's granddaddy uh, who did Black Athena. But at any rate, is the word there and it made me think about the idea het in ancient egyptian language speaks to this concept of work but work as an occupation as a craft so in other words labor at its heart in ancient egyptian and then you look at the yoruba so you know i'm Asking my Yoruba friends, you know, his, this is one of the great Yoruba dictionaries. I like this Yoruba dictionary. This is uh, um, Kayode Fakin uh, Lede's book on Yoruba, if you can see here, get it here. Yeah, modern dictionary of Yoruba. Here, Emily. I'm looking at definitions of labor and, and blending that with what I know about work in different African societies. Work is often connected to what you do for the community, same as in these other societies, but you see specialization. 
blacksmiths, for example. It's very interesting that Nat Turner's son that we talked about, Gilbert Turner, when Miss, uh, Miss Lucy Mae Turner said, my daddy was good with iron work. He was like a blacksmith. I smile because blacksmithing in West Africa is a, is a vocation, but it isn't just about making iron. Often the blacksmiths, when you read uh, books like the Mende Blacksmiths, so you read Robert Ferris Thompson's work, uh, they had a book called Striking Iron. They had a big exhibit at the Museum of African Art talks about this. If you were an iron worker, you were often also a priest. Because iron, when it's molten, is a metaphor in many of those societies for blood. So we know the function of blood. In other words, iron is like blood. So you don't just work with iron because you're good with iron. You work with iron because you have been spiritually brought in the rites of passage into this craft. And part of your work as an iron worker is connected. Many roles in society. So labor, you have this kind of thing. But here's where the things collide, right? You see during enslavement, Africans are brought here for their labor. This is why the genius of, a uh, again, can never say that, uh, that this book can never state this book enough. It's very important. Um, the great Black Reconstruction in America, of course. We see Du Bois, Dr. Du Bois, Black Reconstruction in America. Uh, this is the Oxford Oxford uh, uh, edition, which uh, I didn't I didn't go get. I have the Du Bois one, the original, but I just get the table of contents here. Dr. Du Bois starts chapter one, the Black worker. The framework of this book, published in 1935, is still the best. Let me pair that with another one I would encourage people to get. This is more recent. This came out a couple of years ago by the great uh, Dr. Joe Trotter. Joe Trotter at Carnegie Mellon, good brother, who wrote this book, Workers on Arrival, Black Labor and the Making of America, Joe William Trotter. This is important because when you put this book with this book, I like this framework better. This book is very up to date, including a great bibliographic essay to tell you history of Black labor in America, in the US. But what Du Bois notes is, you brought people here not to be human, but to work. And so the meaning of black life in the American social structure is labor. But I don't mean labor for the community that black people were trying to build. I mean, whatever you were trying to build. So we become slaves, later Pullman porters, later Amazon drivers, <laughs> later, in other words, essential personnel. Think about the context of black labor in the context of, we don't care about your humanity. Why? We're capitalists. We don't care about white people's humanity. We don't care about immigrants' humanity. We damn sure don't care about your humanity. You are labor. So when they say Labor Day, we celebrate labor. Labor is a title. Label is a la labor is a label. Label isn't our labor isn't our humanity. Labor is not your life unless you come from a society where what you do is connected, which is what reminds me again to the ancient Egyptian uh, word mer, M R. We pronounced it with like mer because we put an E in because we don't know where their vowels were. The glyphs for the word mer, the glyph, the, the the drawing of the word mer. I'm doing like this because you see a backhoe. Like uh, it's like a little, little V with a little line through it. It's a backhoe. You use it to break up the ground. The word for love in ancient Egyptian, the symbol for it is a tool of labor. In other words, you devote your effort to the thing that you love. If you love your family, you love your community. And you see that in human existence. At the same time that capital is not quote unquote paying people their worth, you can never pay people their worth. Why? Their worth isn't attached to a material number. However, in a capitalist society, you should pay them more since you do count value by number because you have suppressed them and now they're doing things they wouldn't do. They're working for you because that's what you need them to do. So we come to a conclusion by saying that this American apartheid system created both parallel labor stratification and a sense of shared obligation and community. What do I mean? After enslavement, you see apartheid, say black community, white community. In the black community, you start seeing a labor stratification that looks like the white community, black doctors, black lawyers, black teachers, and then you go down black laboring class, maybe the Pullman porters become that, right, among others, and, and maids. Then below that, you got the people who are unskilled labor. And so now it looks like the white thing. But the difference is within that black community, that's, that governance structure, apartheid is keeping them together. So apartheid keeps them together. So black labor is all moving to try to smash Jim Crow. They gotta, they gotta destroy the oppression. 
segregation, humiliation, you know, this question of can we have opportunity? But once apartheid is over, once Jim Crow is over, once those laws change, particularly with the highlight of the 1960s federal legislation, we have not resolved the challenge of remaking the society we want to be in. In fact, it's hardly even mentioned. We don't have a critique of capitalism. But what do we do? We reinforce the white values. Go to school, make more money, take care of your family. What about the rest of us? Yeah, we don't like police brutality. We don't like nothing like that. And we should move together, but you just got to work hard. Hold on, hold on. We haven't even had an intelligence conversation. So when we think about that generation that smashed Jim Crow, labor was at the center of it. And so it's funny because knowing it's Labor Day weekend, I, I pulled this to reread. In fact, let me just, let me end with this. Let me see. Let me see. Where did I do with Larry Ty's book? Oh man, here it is. Rising from the Rails, the Pullman Porter. This is, I love the way he opens this book. Ty says this, the most influential black man in America for the hundred years following the Civil War was a figure no one knew. He was not the educated W.B. Du Bois. He was not uh, Book, uh, uh, Booker T. Washington, although both were inspired by him. He was not the one black man to appear in more movies than Harry Belafonte or Sidney Poitier. He discovered the North Pole alongside Admiral Perry and helped give birth to the blues. He launched the Montgomery bus boycott that sparked the civil rights movement and tapped Martin Luther King to lead both. The most influential black man in America was the Pullman Porter. In that one paragraph, Matthew Henson worked the railroad. Elijah McCoy mm. on the railroad figured out an invention that allowed for the free circulation of oil to keep the engine running. And it was so brilliant that Elijah McCoy, pre-figuring the Pullman Porter on the railroad, the one they call it, they, they, they then realized this guy is so brilliant that as, as inventions came up that he made and then patent, they had to figure out, is this yours or is it the real McCoy? That's where the real McCoy came from, the Pullman line. Malcolm X, Red Fox, oh my God. Benjamin Mays worked as a Pullman porter <laughs> before he came to press. What Larry Ty documents, he goes through, this book came out in, I think, 2004. When he decided to write this book, he realized most of these guys got to be gone. He put ads in newspapers. He put in the black press. He went all over the country. He went and talked to people. He, he met up with different people around the country. And eventually he's able to interview 40, over 40 Pullman porters. He said the youngest of them were in their 80s. The oldest ones were over 100 years old. And I took the stories of the Pullman porter. C.L. Dellums, we talked about C.L. Dellums out there in Oakland, who was a Rhonda Pullman porter. He became the president of the Brothers of Sleeping Car Porters after A. Philip Randolph, 1968. But I wanna, I, I read that as the first part of ending. The second part is I just pulled one of the most important Pullman porters to make this point. This is Edgar Daniel Nixon Sr. Ain't been a whole lot written about him. This is my old Tennessee State classmate, April Woodson. Wrote a book called Freedom is Never Free, a biographical portrait of Edgar Daniel Nixon. Edgar Daniel Nixon. We know Edgar Daniel Nixon as E.D. Nixon, the Pullman Porter who heard A. Philip Randolph, in fact, 1928. A. Philip Randolph started Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters in 1925, gave a talk at the Elks Lodge in New York. This is what E.D. Nixon said. E.D. Nixon was from Montgomery, Alabama. I should tell y'all who this is. He said, most important part of my education came in 1928 in St. Louis when I met A. Philip Randolph. See, I was on the St. Louis to Jacksonville run. Oh, by the way, the Pullman Porters is the reason Black people had the Chicago Defender in the South. Because they would get the paper in Chicago and take it and throw it out of the train in the middle of the night into the fields in Mississippi and Louisiana. Uh, in fact, the train that Emmett Till took down and that, his, that he came back on in terms of his body, they call that one um, the uh, city of New Orleans. Some of y'all heard that, some of y'all old school. If y'all in the chat, I hope y'all adding Pullman Porter stories because my granddaddy was offered a job in the in, in the railroads in Connecticut. He says too cold, so he stayed in Alabama. Thank God he did. <laughs> the railroad, this is the story, but y'all got these stories. So y'all put these in the comments because when I said read these comments, we see the other stories Larry Ty probably didn't get. But when his body came back, came back on the city of New Orleans. Who's working those trains? The Pullman Porters. The, the maids. In other words, Emmett Till had an honor guard coming back to Chicago, mm -hmm. but it's invisible 
to the social structure. Ain't nobody gonna let nothing happen to it. And if they caught you with the Chicago Defender, they would have to hide it in the floorboards or stash it in the back because they didn't, why, the, the company didn't want them doing that. The great migration was triggered by the Pullman porters because when they didn't have a uniform on, they were somebody else. So E.D. Nixon was on the uh, the St. Louis to Jacksonville run. Well, when we would get to a city like St. Louis, the company always had a place for porters to sleep. He goes on, he says, we heard about it. He said, I'm gonna start a chapter. A, what does he do? E.D. Nixon starts a chapter of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters in Montgomery. He also starts in 1928, the chapter in Montgomery of the NAACP. Y'all see where we're going with this. It was Edgar Daniel Nixon. Let me show you a little picture of him here. Because Eleanor Roosevelt, he, he, she was friends with him. There's E.D. Nixon as a younger man. Here's E.D. Nixon with the NAACP Youth Council. E.D. Nixon, right here, E.D. Nixon recruited a lady in her early 40s to be the secretary for the NAACP Youth Council. She and her husband lived in Montgomery. Uh, his, his, her, her husband's name was Raymond. Her name was Rosa Parks. Edgar Daniel Nixon used his organizing skills to strike blows against segregation in Montgomery for decades, along with this brother right here. This is Vernon Johns. <laughs> Y'all see where we're going about. There's not been a lot written about Vernon Johns. His niece, of course, who led the strike, the walkout in Prince Edward County, Virginia, uh, Vernon Johns here. This is an interesting book on Vernon Johns. Vernon Johns was deposed as the pastor at Dexter Street, Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery. The young brother they brought in uh, became the pastor, but the man who more than any other single individual, by the way, he traveled all over here, he is with Percy Sutton, <laughs> E.D. Nixon over there with Percy Sutton. The man who recruited this young, uh, who recruited this young brother into what becomes the Montgomery Improvement Association helps develop, E.D. Nixon is the one that tapped Martin Luther King more than anybody else. But it, but as Dr. King said, and at the 25th anniversary of the Montgomery bus boycott in 1980, the Montgomery Proof Association invited E.D. Nixon, will you come speak? Nixon declined. He said, y'all haven't asked me to do anything. Y'all haven't asked. And he, by the end of his life, he was very hurt because Nixon was like, we were fighting for this for years and organized labor was at the center. Organized black labor was at the center. Dr. King would never have been able to do what he did. And some people like Fred Gray, who's still alive, King's lawyer, Browder versus Gale, we talked about that one, um, said, y'all got whole highways named for Martin Luther King and there's nothing in Montgomery, not even a street corner named for Edgar Daniel Nixon. But E.D. Nixon represented the organized labor and the Pullman Porters and organized that, that question of how our people made history, as Kwame Ture used to say this, if you put Martin Luther King in Montgomery, if you put him in Birmingham, if you put him in Selma by himself, he will be killed. It is history is made by the masses of the people. So on this Labor Day weekend, take the opportunity to ask even the people in your family, to ask yourself and our communities, what kind of jobs did y'all do that you did because you had to do them for the family? What kind of work do you do because the work you love? And what role did you help play that nobody ever asked you about in this struggle that we've had against this social structure? This is really just, Black people should take Labor Day as a weekend where we give thanks to those who labor for us in ways that we couldn't imagine having to do, including the people in your family and mine. But but I, I like that E.D. Nixon story because E.D. Nixon is the story to pull reporters, even though they shouldn't have done that to the sisters. I, but anyway, that's <laughs> I mean, but what's so beautiful about this space that we're in right now, what we're doing and what we're building is that we're remember, remembering and making sure yes, yes. that these stories get told and that they don't get forgotten and that we do put the pieces together so that we can tell full, complete stories to the next generation. Nobody <laughs> should have half a piece of story or some distorted version of what happened when we all are here with memory and the ability to ask people in our family the questions that you're challenging us to do. And, and the more we grow in narrative, the more there's going to be space for us to share our own narratives, our stories, our genealogy, the stories of our family history. Because if we don't put it together, and if we don't do that work, um, we, you know, we can be victimized by a system that uh, absolutely wants us to know nothing about anything other than to get to work.
says that she loves me Isn't it lovely when the one who loves thing is the one